Now that we have collected data for our training and test sets, it's time to create a model to recognize our keywords. But first, we need to generate some features. You might think that we can just use the raw audio samples to train our model, but as we saw in the accelerometer example, raw data does not often make the best features. The model might attempt to learn features like volume and position of the utterance in the frame, which would make for a poor model. To fix this, we need to extract some features. In fact, we're going to extract features that mimic how humans perceive sounds. In the 1800s, French mathematician Joseph Fourier discovered that any repeating signal can be represented by an infinite sum of sine and cosine waves at different frequencies. This gave rise to the Fourier transform, which allows us to break any signal into its frequency components. If we were to take the Fourier transform of this whole sample, we might see some overall trends in the frequencies, but we would lose any information about how the frequencies change over time. So let's take a small window of time and compute the fast Fourier transform, or the FFT. Because our audio recording consists of a series of equally spaced samples rather than a continuous line, we need to use the discrete Fourier transform, and the FFT is just a more computationally efficient way of computing that. In this small window of time, we can see which frequencies are present. The human voice is generally between 300 and 3400 hertz, which is often generalized to being between 300 and 3000 hertz. Lower pitch are closer to 300 Hz and higher pitches are closer to 3400 Hz. Now let's slide the window over a bit, maybe even overlapping with the previous window. Because this is now a different section of the spoken word, the frequencies might change some, so the output of our FFT will change. If we do this for the whole sample, we can record each FFT in a column to construct a 3D plot known as a spectrogram. The y-axis is the frequency and the x-axis is time. The z-axis would be the amplitude of each frequency bin or spectral component from the FFT. Rather than a fully 3D plot, you'll often see the z-axis represented as colors. In this case, whites and reds indicate a high amplitude of that particular frequency and blues are low amplitudes. Now, we're approaching something that neural networks can work with. Spectrograms are basically images and sounds create unique spectrograms. We can use the same machine learning techniques that differentiate images of cats and dogs to identify sounds. The spectrogram is a great feature set for identifying non-vocal sounds like glass breaking, knocking, traffic, and so on. It might also be good for animal sounds, but for human speech, we need to take it a step further. Before we get into that, let's talk about an important limitation of the FFT. The discrete Fourier transform and the fast Fourier transform have an important limitation that you should be aware of when designing systems that use them. According to the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, in order to fully capture all of the detail in a signal, meaning we could reconstruct the original continuous time signal, we must sample at a frequency greater than two times the highest frequency component in that signal. For example, let's take a look at that slice of the spoken word hello again. This time, let's pretend that some audio signal was present at 10 kilohertz. This could be some harmonic from the voice or maybe a bird singing in the background at 10 kilohertz. Because of how the math of the discrete Fourier transform and similarly the FFT works, we're only able to see frequencies up to one half of our sampling rate. In this case, our sampling rate is 16 kilohertz, which I'll denote as F sub S. Half that rate would be 8 kilohertz. This half rate is known as the Nyquist frequency. Thanks to that Fourier transform math, any frequency component beyond that rate gets mirrored and added back into the original FFT. This is known as aliasing. The end FFT would look something like this, with that high frequency component now present at 6 kHz. Obviously, this is not what we wanted, since we only cared about looking for things inside that 8 kHz range. The common way of preventing aliasing is to use a low-pass filter, which is known as an anti-aliasing filter in this case. We set the cutoff frequency at or near the Nyquist frequency. A basic ideal low-pass filter would multiply all the frequencies below the cutoff by 1 and all the frequencies above it by 0. This would effectively cancel out any component above our Nyquist frequency and ensure that there's no aliasing in our final FFT. 
If you make an analog version of this anti-aliasing filter, then you could ensure that anything beyond the Nyquist frequency was canceled out. This is because you could filter before your analog to digital converter that sampled at 16 kilohertz. This approach requires more electronic components, but some microphones do have filters built in. If you were to filter after sampling, you might still see some aliasing if you tried to sample sounds greater than 16 kilohertz. A digital filter applied to your captured signal may not help you if the aliasing shows up in the filter's passband. Don't worry if all that seems like a lot to take in. You could spend an entire career doing digital signal processing. The important takeaway here is that you want to make sure that anything you're recording has a frequency of less than half of your sampling frequency. Filters can help you out, but if your target sounds were captured and recorded before the filter, they won't do you much good. To compute features for human speech, one good approach would be to mimic how our ears work. We can compute the Mel frequency sepstral coefficients, which is a decent approach for turning raw sound into a set of numbers that approximates how we interpret speech. To begin, we take the FFT of a windowed slice of our waveform, just like before. You'll find that Edge Impulse filters out anything below 300 hertz as it's not needed for speech recognition. We then create a set of Mel spaced triangular filters for this FFT. There are usually over 20 filters for most speech applications, but I'm going to show you eight here as an example. The filters for less than 1 kilohertz are about evenly spaced apart with equal width. Above 1 kilohertz, they become wider and are logarithmically spaced out. This is to mimic how the ear perceives sound, as the cochlea divides up frequencies in a nonlinear fashion. The energy of each filter is computed, which is found by summing the area under the curve after multiplying the FFT by the filter. These energy values are stored in an array. I've shown it with low frequency energies at the top and high frequency energies at the bottom. We then compute the logarithm of each energy value. Again, this mimics how humans hear sound. We don't perceive loudness on a linear scale, but rather on a logarithmic scale. Finally, we take the discrete cosine transform, or DCT, of this group of energy values. Because the filters are overlapping, the DCT allows us to decorrelate the energy values and it compresses the information. The output of this DCT operation is the Mel frequency sepstral coefficients, or MFCCs. The number of output values from the DCT is equal to the number of input values. So if we started with 32 filters, you should expect to see 32 MFCCs in the end. Note that the compression function function of the DCT allows us to drop higher MFCCs. Lower MFCCs describe the overall shape of the input signal, whereas the higher coefficients describe fast changes in the shape. When it comes to voice recognition, we only care about the overall shape of the spectrogram, and the DCT helps us get there. In most speech recognition applications, you'll see 20 to 30 MFCCs computed, and only the first 12 or 13 are actually used. The rest are just dropped. To create our full feature set for this one sample, we actually need to compute the MFCCs a number of times. We start with a window over the first part of the audio and compute the MFCCs. Note that in Edge Impulse, you'll see this window also referred to as a frame. For our project, we'll compute 32 MFCCs and drop the last 19 as we don't need them. That will give us 13 MFCCs for the first window. We then slide the window over some, overlapping a bit with the first window. We compute the MFCCs from that window and store them next to the first set. We repeat this process until we end up with 49 sets of 13 MFCC values. Like the spectrogram, we end up with something that looks like an image. We can use neural networks meant for image classification for this task. Here are the MFCCs for hello and stop. You can see some slight differences, but it's much easier for a computer to spot these differences. Let's compute our features in Edge Impulse. In your Edge Impulse project, head to the Impulse Design page. Leave the window size at 1000 milliseconds as that's the length of our samples. Click to add a processing block. You should see MFCC and spectrogram blocks as recommended blocks. Since we're doing voice data, let's go with the MFCC block, so click to add it. Next, let's add a neural network as our learning block. Even though MFCCs look like images, we won't be using transfer learning for this. Click Save Impulse and head to the MFCC page. These settings should look pretty familiar. We see that we're using 13 Mel frequency sepstral coefficients, the frame, or window, size is 20 milliseconds. By default, there is no overlap on the windows, and you can adjust the FFT parameters. Note that we're filtering out everything below 300 hertz as it's not needed for picking up speech. 
The high frequency is set to zero, but that actually means it's set to the Nyquist frequency, which is 8 kHz for our samples. A preemphasis filter is used to amplify the higher frequencies in the signal before computing the MFCCs, which can often help in speech recognition. For now, we'll leave everything as default. However, you're welcome to play with them later to see if they affect the model's ability to recognize words. Head to the Generate Features tab and click Generate Features. Wait for a few minutes while all of those MFCCs are computed. When it's done, you should see a broad representation of your data in the Feature Explorer. Because it's nearly impossible to visualize 637 dimensions, Edge Impulse combines the MFCCs of each sample to create this 3D plot for us. Edge Impulse performs the UMAP algorithm on each set of MFCCs to reduce the dimensions down to three. It's similar to a clustering algorithm that takes all of the pixels from the MFCC image and tries to group them together based on similarity. MFCC spectrograms that look alike end up as points close together in this plot, and ones that don't look similar end up as points farther away. Feel free to move the plot around to see if you can see some separation among the groups. If so, that's good news, as it means our machine learning algorithm should be able to separate them as well. Well, with that, we're ready to train.